there's something about Wyoming that just makes me breathe like deeply. I, it's so big and so open. I'm on my weekly drive whenever I'm in town to my masseuse in the big town, about 30 minutes away from my small town, which is not really a big town, but, <laughs> um, and it's been a wonderful journey with this masseuse when it comes to the psychedelic somatic integration work that I'm doing and the interview that's about to come up with Saj and Annie. Uh, Saj, director of education, Annie, my facilitator, my angel, my goddess, who's been there through with me, uh, helping me understand the trauma that was looping in my body for my whole life that I had no idea. And this uh, structural massage masseuse, he's been along the journey uh, for the whole time as well. Okay, so I'm coming into this small little town. Let's see how many, what is it? Population 400. And 31. Okay, yeah. So this is how small it is around here. So my structural masseuse, he, in the very beginning, I was just like, oh, traumatized. Uh, PTSD, right? Like, just, oh, afraid for anybody to touch me. And then as I started the PSI work, um, there, it's a disassociation. Like, there's a numbness. Like, I didn't know. I couldn't feel my hips, my hip flexors, uh, my groin, um, areas in my neck were just on, they wouldn't turn off. I'm like, I'm relaxed. It's like, no, they're nonstop on Alana, the back of your head and the back of your neck. So he helped. And then as you are in, a, one is in allowance of this disassociation, then as you come back in, oh, not fun, nauseous, hopeless. And then the emotions start to come online and, and in the pain of the body, um, what's held there, oh, rage, fury. Um, panic, fear, um, just horrendous hopelessness, sorrow, sadness. Uh, and my sweet structural masseuse, I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. When I lose my shit, it's cool. Don't fix it. Just be an allowance of it. Let's just let it do its thing and my body would move and I would have all these different like shaking or sometimes I get really, really hot. And he'd just be like, it's all cool, man. It's all cool. <laughs> he always calls me ma'am. <laughs> and, uh, and it's been beautiful over the last year to watch me become embodied. To um, notice there is less pain in these areas of my body. To um, feel the, the joyful energy. Like when, when the other stuff leaves, like be curious about what comes in. Uh, joy. Capacity expansiveness, um, goofiness. So we've had a good old time. We never know what's coming. He's always up for the ride and I'm super grateful. So I'm about to get there and have my weekly massage. And uh, you are about to dive into an incredible conversation with Saj and Annie. And right out of the gate, I just kind of lost my shit. I was just so happy tears grateful because I am experiencing well-being in my body and in my heart and in my soul and in my hips for the first time in my life. So let's begin. Welcome to Intimate Conversations, Soul Medicine. Intimacy is an inside job. Hello, you delicious people, and welcome to another episode of Intimate Conversations. Here we are, season 11, and we're calling it Soul Medicine. And this month's theme is trauma. This show is for people that are ready to live unapologetically and enjoy heart open relationships, not just with your delicious beloved, but that heart open relationship with yourself, with your body and with the divine. So today we are diving into psychedelic somatic interactional psychotherapy with the director of education and psychotherapist Saj Razvi, also known as Saji Baba, <laughs> and among other distinctions of which she has many, we also have with us psychedelic somatic interactive therapist Annie King, also known as the angel of my life for the last nine months or so. So let me tell you a little bit more about each of them and we will dive in. Annie has spent 20 years exploring alignment in the physical body, practicing and teaching neuromuscular therapy and therapeutic yoga. Annie's work in PSI realizes her longtime dream of offering therapeutic plans that integrate safe, 
legal and powerful psychedelic medicines to the interactive somatic therapy modalities that she's practiced for many years as an advanced cranial sacral therapist of which she is the bomb. PSI combines um, the deeply resourcing and profoundly calming ability of somatic therapy to reorganize the body's fight or flight nervous system with the trust expanding, ego disarming effect of purposeful psychedelic work. Annie's work is for those seeking to expand their consciousness and deepen the relationship with themselves and their loved ones in a more present and heart centered way. So that's the amazing Annie. Moving on to Saj, as I said before, he's the director of education at PSI. And he's a psychotherapist and former clinical researcher in the MAPS phase two trial of MDMA assisted psychotherapy. He is a faculty at Mind Medicine Australia and taught PTSD studies at the University of Denver. And he is one of the primary developers of the psychedelic somatic interactional psychotherapy, PSIP modality, which is a next generation primary consciousness-oriented psychotherapy. And the focus of PSIP is to maximize the relational and autonomic healing capacity of psychedelic medicine to treat complex childhood developmental trauma. And his primary focus is to train clinicians to provide legal, effective psychedelic treatment in their private practices, utilizing readily accessible medicines such as cannabis and ketamine, and he provides PSI training and supervision to students internationally. All right, those are their amazing bios. Now, right from my heart, I read your personal story, Saj. And I've had one client uh, who, after working with them as a couple, he didn't make it. And so the depth of your heart is, I it really, I, I feel it. And I don't think this is an exaggeration. Not sure I would have made it without the work that I've done with Annie and Matthew. I'm so grateful. I am more myself than I've ever been. Everyone says it, everyone can feel it. Um, and it is the greatest honor and privilege to begin this season 11, having the two of you on. So big group hug right out of the gate here. So <laughs> loving, loving on both of you. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful way to start. Thank you for having us here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I want to start with the conversation about talk therapy, like the iceberg, why it's not enough. So Saj, could we start there? And then Annie, could you follow up? Yeah, happy to start there. So, um, you know, the world of uh, therapy is kind of has different modalities in it, obviously. Um, talk therapy is the most common one, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, it rests, it focuses on insight, awareness, uh, connecting the dots, uh, understanding where the patterns have come from. And this would be what the world of neuroscience calls declarative memory systems, meaning that, you know, you're referencing your story, you're referencing uh, memories that you have that you have conscious access to and that you can put into language that you can verbalize. Now, the world, uh, the, the, uh, that's only a, a fraction of the human mind. Uh, so much more of us, so much more of our childhoods, of our, our uh, you know, the experiences that, were, that formed us live in what's called non-declarative memory, our memory that's not consciously available to us, memory that's not easily, easily put into language. Uh, because, I mean, so think about it, there's a phenomenon in the world of psychology called um, attachment, right? So attachment is something that happens between the ages of zero and, you know, two, two, two to three years old. And nobody remembers that period of their life, right? But, and yet attachment has a profound capacity to influence the rest of our lives. It's the, it could be a core lens through which we experience ourselves and other people. And yet we have, there's no words to describe uh, the, the process of attachment. It is such a experiential learning that infants go through that then we carry with us. Right, right. Thank you. And Annie, why is this relevant? You're, you're like me, you're helping people have these heart-centered relationships. Why is it important that we understand that so much of what's going on we're not even aware of? <clears throat> uh, I can only speak from my experience. Um, I spent a large part of my early adult life trying to get out of pain, physical pain, emotional pain. 
Yeah. And I tried everything, cognitive behavioral therapy, neuro-linguistic programming, adult child of an alcoholic, body work, rolfing, you name it. And everything helped to an extent. It was beneficial. Nothing hurt me. But it wasn't until I met Saj and began the work with the PSI P community that I was able to access the drivers, hmm. what was underneath the surface, the suppressed emotion that I was holding in my body, that I finally started being able to discharge what wasn't serving me and get out of pain. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> why, why Saj? I'm like Annie. I've done 20 years of this work. I've been teaching and being a facilitator of this work. I call it quantum psychology psychology or spiritual technology or somatic work. I've done how many ayahuasca journeys for the last 20 years, but Annie on our first session uncovered the source, um, was the facilitator to help me and my body uncover the source of why I'd been attracting abusive relationship after abusive relationship, not just romantically, but professionally as well. Why is it that I've done all this work and even done psychedelics, but it still didn't change anything? Well, uh, because human beings are complex and because we have extraordinary defense mechanisms uh, that are, you know, there for good reasons. Uh, they're not random. And, you know, so something that I will say in, in our trainings is that, you know, just, you know, imagine somebody sh showing up with a lifelong history of being defended, armored, guarded for, again, appropriate reasons. And if this person takes a psychedelic, do we imagine that all of their defense mechanisms are instantly going to go away simply because they took a psychedelic? And of course, the answer to that is no, <laughs> right? So there are ways in which the, the human uh, mind has uh, can sublimate, can hijack even psychedelic medicines for its own purposes. Um, so, so for example, something like uh, dissociation, which is a huge uh, um, factor in in trauma and PTSD. You know, um, the way that our minds work with dissociation is that you know we're not designed to see what's behind that dissociative blank wall. And, and I think psychedelics can do wonders for that, but they have to be focused to do that. So, so um, somebody can take a psychedelic and if they have really profound early childhood wounds, the psychedelic can just go to other places. You know, we can support it going to other places instead of sort of that core place. And so I think we have to have a little bit of pressurization or a little bit of a container that's designed uh, to sort of channel the direction that the psychedelic takes in a person's system. Yeah, makes total sense. Like in the past, if I could see it, I could integrate it in myself or in my clients, right? And, and when um, I'm with Annie and she's like, let's just stay with the cold. And I'm like, why? But <laughs> so tell them, Annie, how we discovered, I didn't even understand what disassociation was. How can you be with something that's not even there? So help people ex to understand, because this to me is the key. I've looked all my life, but this changed everything. So I think Saj is better at answering this question about disassociation possibly than I am. It's a, it's a difficult thing to describe. We're noticing the absence of something. We're noticing when we're not fully present, where we're kind of here, but not. Our culture selects for this state. Alcohol helps us disassociate. Binge watching television helps us disassociate. We are constantly managing over uh, being overstimulated by shutting down. So it's not a bad thing. The, the drawback is just that we're dead. Yeah. So let me, let me punt to Saj here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just building on top of that. Um, so yeah, I, I think dissociation is really important to understand uh, because it's, well, <laughs> we, we can very frequently be dissociated around the concept of dissociation. <laughs> and so, um, so Bessel van der Kolk, who's a pretty well-known traumatologist and researcher in the field, uh, did uh, some 
some studies and one of the things that they did was they brought in war veterans uh, and these were people, this particular study was done way back in 1994 and these were people that were in Vietnam. And so they brought, so basically, you know, 20 plus years after the Vietnam War, Bessel van der Kolk's group brought these veterans in and they gave them some little exposure to the, the trauma of war, like a smell of diesel fuel or a sound or a sight. And they found that these veterans dissociated, meaning that there we have what are called endogenous opioids, um, basically uh, homegrown numbing hormones, numbing uh, neurotransmitters that our nervous system, our brains can release to protect us from uh, traumatic events. Um, and and what Vanderkoek found was that when they gave these veterans an echo of the war, their level of dissociation 20 years after the war was profound, meaning that they had they had to give people the equivalent of, um, I believe it was eight milligrams of morphine um, to match the level of dissociation that these veterans bodies were producing organically by themselves. And I don't know if you know, but that's a lot of <laughs> numbing. That's a lot of uh, morphine in, in uh, hospital settings. They'll use two to four milligrams for severe breakthrough pain. Okay. Right. So, so it's, it's a very real thing. It's not, it's not psychosomatic. It's a very physiological thing that happens when people get to a point of overwhelm. Uh, when we, the way we define it is when somebody's active defenses fail them, meaning that they're fighting, they're fleeing, they're, you know, kicking, punching, doing anything they can to escape a situation. When that fails, when it doesn't work, their system moves into what are called passive defensive responses, which are, uh, which is the numbing, which is the op endogenous opioids. Mm, yes. Um, taking it back to our, our real life experience, Annie, uh, I had no clue. Well, I'm good at surrendering to my body. I'm a, I'm a dancer, so I know how to do that. I'm trained in allowance. When the emotion comes up, allow it. It knows what to do. But when we went through these experiences and I realized what I had left and not experienced myself, um, help explain to them how that how that happened, what it was like to be a witness of that, and and maybe the experience of how through through allowance we got all the way back to to zero, to still point. Um <clears throat> again, we're like lasagna. <laughs> of all of the states there are four states to the autonomic nervous system um well-being if we're lucky we have well-being one anxiety two fear betrayal hatred three hopeless helpless depressed four disassociation so when things have happened to us that we cannot cope with we disassociate we shut down the, the experience is still here, all the hatred, all the, you know, fear is here, but it's just iced over. Yeah. It's closed down, it's shut down, we can't feel it. Um, and as, as Saj taught me in the, in the PSIP training, this is where the gold is in, in our bodies, because underneath that is all the suppressed material. So we, in trainings are things that I've done before, like EMDR, and all kinds of things. We would just jump right out as soon as the person would disassociate. In the mm -hmm. PSIP training, what we learn through the research that Sash can talk to you about is to stay with it, to associate to what's disassociated, to really tell me, like I'm from another planet, what's it like to be dead? What's mm -hmm. it like to not feel anything? Tell me all about it. Is it cold on the surface or all the way through are you cold are you floaty are you here tell me what it's like and so you can describe it to me and as you are with yourself noticing and allowing disassociation it starts to change sometimes it takes a long time but it will always crack and then the person starts coming back to being able to feel themselves and feeling life and it's an incredible experience because underneath all of that dead is everything that we put away and hidden from ourselves because we couldn't deal with it. And we come back to life. Yeah. And so. I really acknowledge how compassionately you did that for me. It was life-changing. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And Sash did that for me. 
and it mm-hmm. was life changing. And yeah. it's, it's amazing to be, not even realize you're dead. I had no idea I had so much shut down in my nervous system. Um, yeah. To be fully alive is a whole nother ball game. Right. Yes. I was running so fast and knowingly, I didn't even know I had an inside. I remember the first time I actually slowed down. I'm like, oh, this sucks. Let's run faster. Right. And, and just keep leaving and trying to be the people pleaser and trying to be safe and, and to have the support of the medicine in the structure of let's allow this. I knew enough to know that allowance worked, yeah. but to allow the, the dead and allow it didn't get better before it, I mean, it got worse before it got better. And so that's where I want to go to go next through my own training uh, with my clients. I know that it will pass. I know that that incredible rage or that terror or that panic, I know it will pass. It's another thing to do it ourselves. but talk about what are they, what is it called? This um, window of tolerance, you know, don't re-traumatize your, your client. But in this, we went for the jugular. We went full on 10 out of 10 experiencing it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to speak to that. Um, so I think what you're describing there, the window of tolerance is a um, concept that's in a lot of somatic psychology, and I think it's spread to other areas of psychology. And the basic idea is that if somebody is too activated, meaning they're hyper aroused, um, that's not a very functional place to do psychotherapy. And if somebody is hypo aroused, meaning that they're too numbed out, too dissociative, flat, depressed, that's also not a useful range to do psychotherapy. So the window of tolerance is saying, you know, stay within a, uh, a window of, um, where you can communicate, you can feel things, you can move, you can do all sorts of things like that. And then, and then we can do therapy in that window. Now, I think the problem with that. So, well, let me inter- let me speak to the intelligence of it. Why that I think concept came about is because people were c- concerned about re-traumatizing a client, right? So, um, however, the problem with it is that trauma does not ever exist in a window of tolerance. <laughs> trauma doesn't exist in a comfortable zone for us. Oh. The reason why it's trauma is because it is extreme, right? It is hyper aroused, hypo aroused. And my sense of it is that you have to make contact with where the client is. If if the client is deep in dissociation, you have to make contact with them there. If the client is in, in hyper aroused states, we have to be able to go there. And I'll tell you that I think one of the difficulties that somatic modalities that adhere to the window of tolerance, one of the difficulties they're going to have combining with psychedelics is that psychedelics every single time take people well out of the window of tolerance. Um, So I was one of the researchers in the, uh, the MAPS trial for MDMA. And I will tell you, you know, every single one of our participants would leave uh, the window of tolerance with while working with MDMA. Right. So, um, so yeah, we, we have to go to where, where the, where the wound is. Right. And my experience, uh, is that it passes quite quickly and, and that there's nothing, well, not that there's nothing to be afraid of. There's a lot to be afraid of, but you breathe through it and it, and it passes. And to me, it leaves such wisdom and awarenesses. And, and I would things that I, I didn't, I could smell things. I could feel sensations in my body. I could hear people's words that created beliefs. It was fascinating what happened to me ter- when I came back in to to understand what was going on. How scientifically does that work? Like when I disassociated as a kid, I have no memories. The body has the memories, but I have no memories. And that's why it all comes back with the psychedelics. Is that correct? Yeah, um, I think both psychedelics and the body process, uh, they, they both work towards, again, non-declarative memory systems, right? So again, you your system has come up with protection mechanisms, you know, dissociation blocks against what happened. And, and even though those were needed at one time, because, you know, you probably didn't have the resources or the support to deal with this, but at this point, it's a different story. And so we don't need the same protection mechanisms. And so once we clear away the dissociation, yeah, there's a whole lot that does come back through for people. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Annie, I'd like to say that it's important to understand, first of all, that we as 
um, <clears throat> witnesses working with a client are never saying, okay, now I want you to tell me all about your trauma, me trauma memory. We no. never do that. We're listening to your body and your inner in your primary consciousness and what it's it's exposing to your your secondary consciousness to your ego and working with what comes up there and and sometimes disassociation is not quick it doesn't clear quickly it can go on for a very long time mm -hmm. um, depending on the what kind of trauma it was the amount of trauma there's all kinds of things so um i wouldn't want people to think oh yeah you feel this disassociation zip zap it's gone it's definitely not like that a lot of the time i've done five series um and still things are arising and and it's been quite a quite a commitment i love these these statements we feel the body is the greatest ally in processing subconscious material that coping mechanisms are based on a fundamental distrust of our body, our roots, and what we're capable of. Annie, Annie, first, like we're we you yoga and dance, and we have more connection with our body. And yet, for me, this process asked me to hundred percent surrender to the body, yeah. and it's deepened my reverence mm -hmm. of the wisdom of the body. So, if both of you could speak about our beautiful bodies to trust. Mm. I think the trauma, the traumatic events that happened to me, I realized under the, the use of the, of the psychedelic that I had lost trust of my body. It didn't protect me. I couldn't, I couldn't rely on it. And so I had lost this fundamental connection to the, the divine source of my being and the medicine helped restore that. And I think all the dancing and movement that I had done was in an attempt to restore. Right. But until I did the medicine with the PSI technique, um, I, I wasn't able to trust my own body or self. And so when there was no way I could therefore trust you, so how could I have any kind of intimacy? And I think this is fairly common. Yeah, thank you. One comment and then Saj, if you'd answer, I think I'm here to teach what I'm here to learn because I didn't say I'd be a gardening expert or even a dating expert. It's like intimacy. Like I knew that's what I was craving within myself. So um, tell us more about the body, Saj. Yeah, well, I mean, it's extraordinary, right? And and I think that the way we're approaching it is that, you know, people I'll put it this way. I think the vast majority of what we work with in mental health, when we're talking about depression, anxiety, panic attacks, PTSD symptoms, uh, a lot of what constitutes relational problems really is a biological expression of what's going on in our lives. Um, it, it, it's either an expression of the po present moment stress of our lives or the past, more likely the past stressors from our life. And so, you know, your conscious mind may not be aware of that on a moment to moment basis, but your body was online, available, tracking and recall, remembering all these experiences that you've had. And um, so people with PTSD tend to have a very uh, antagonistic relationship with their body. They tend to feel like blame the body because that's what they couldn't control. That's what felt the pain. Um, and unfortunately, there's so much capacity in the body to heal. So, I mean, think about it this way that, um, you know, our nervous systems, our body, our biology developed over millions and millions of years while we were in a state of nature, right? So meaning that, you know, threat was a common occurrence in our life. Trauma was a common occurrence in, in life, right? It's only relatively recently that we are no longer on the menu, right? And so, and so the idea is that, you know, when it comes to stress and trauma, our biology knows exactly what it's doing. It knows how to go into these uh, uh, activated and dissociative nervous system states, and it knows how to come back from them. But typically, we interrupt that process, right? So, so I mean, the, basically, what we're relying on here is a, a homeostatic intelligence of the body 
to return to states of neutrality and calm even after trauma has taken place. And the, the trick with it is that that it's not a voluntary thing that we can do. So even though, you know, people can have a very close connection with their bodies in terms of being a, a, a yoga practitioner or, a, you know, having a, a, a like a dance background or something like that, this is a very, the movement patterns that we're seeing here come from an involuntary part of the mind that is very active when uh, stress and trauma are around and they're not coming from you, right? They're not coming from ego. They're not coming from sort of your consciously directed sense of what needs to happen here, right? So this is letting go into something much more primitive, much more primordial that uh, that we find, you know, everybody has access to. It's our, it's our birthright. I'm curious, Annie, how the two of you met, because you've always been on the path. I've been on the path. Um, because this idea of like, I'm super smart, Ivy League grad, like, I would figure this out. And then my trauma made me even more aware, 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 all living in here. And even though I was a dancer, I couldn't get in there. And even though I'd done those other psychedelic um, medicines, I hadn't gotten into there. So tell us how you, how you found Saj in this work and what began to change in your life? We, we've talked a little bit about going from coaching to witnessing, like, and maybe personally, Anything you want to share about how you found him and then the changes that have occurred for you? Well, <clears throat> I was coming out of a health crisis. Um, <clears throat> out of the blue, I got colitis and I mm. couldn't eat anything. Mm. And I did a lot of things trying to heal that. One of them was to go to Panchakarma in India. Right. And while I was in Panchakarma, I, I had known about the MDMA clinical trials. I knew about this kind of work, but I didn't know who was doing it or who was good at it or what was going on in that world. And I knew Rick Doblin with MAPS. And he, he suggested I check out what Saj was doing with what was then called trauma dynamics. Mm. And I went to one of the open houses and I waited till everybody left and Saj was gathering up his books and I just went up and told him what was going on with me. And he put his books down and gave me a full body hug. And he said, you're a traumatized individual and you're trying to manage your trauma by taking care of other people and it's not working anymore. And we would love to have you in our training and we'll start treating your trauma. And I said, well, I'm not an LCSW. I'm not any of those things. And he said, we'll, we'll just pull you in for now and just see what we do. And, and I started the healing process and path that I'm still on to today. Yeah. Oh. Thank, Thank all the goddesses. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and Saj, how did you even, I'm sure you're, you're holding space or witnessing others. How much have you gone through with your own journey and how has that affected your life personally, professionally? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I will say that, you know, people don't become trauma therapists and specialize in that type of work without having their own trauma. You know, it's a, me, me search is research is me search, right? That, that kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, no, I, I came to this with my own pretty profound levels of trauma. And, um, you know, I trained in this modality back in 2003 when it was a completely non psychedelic oriented modality. And, um, you know, uh, I can tell you a little story about that, which is that, you know, we, I went to a weekend workshop with this. I didn't have any of the big picture understanding of what's going on here. Uh, I didn't have the maps or anything like that. And so we just did this, um, group of this exercise and I was seated with another student and we were making sustained eye contact while going into one of the primary interventions of PSIP, which is known as selective inhibition, right? So in other words, we're looking to inhibit all the coping mechanisms, all the management strategies, all the going to the beach in your head and, you know, all the wiggling that people can do to get out of something. We're inhibiting that, which pressurizes the system. So I was doing that for the very first time and my system just started getting incredibly cold. Like literally it felt like my, my feet were sitting in buckets of ice water. They were so painfully cold. And then all of a sudden it popped and 
everything became hot, like sweating hot, burning hot. And then my eyes were wide open and uh, I felt the scream come out of me and it didn't feel like me that was screaming. It felt like something so early that was being accessed. And after it was all said and done, I didn't have any insights about what that was. I couldn't go take notes. I couldn't, you know, there was nothing to, to write down in terms of there, there was nothing for my brain to chew on to say, uh, this is, you know, what this experience was about. But it was an experience that put its finger directly on my nervous system in terms of because that's what that response was. And so I thought to myself, I have no idea what this is, but I want to, I want more. <laughs> so I'm going to keep doing that. <laughs> yeah. oh, so beautiful. Yeah, I remember the first screen of the session with Annie and she's like, relax your neck. I'm like, it is. And, but it, it's just nonstop on as with a lot of other areas. Um, not to have, share too much information, but I always share everything with everybody. I thought I lived in my hips. I mean, I think I've been doing all this work my whole life, maybe through my big open heart. And I'm pretty damn good at dissociating and hearing spirit or dead people or whatever. But oh my goodness, getting back into my hips, I I, I thought I could feel my labia. Nope, numb until one came on, one side came on one day. I'm like, oh, and then it went all the way down my leg and I could feel the earth through my heel. I'm like, oh, and then my bum, my bum muscle, like I have a quad and a hamstring, but the bum muscle, the groin muscle, oh, it came on and I'm like, oh my God. And as I've gotten more and more connected, because I've been guided to do chiropractor and cranial sacral and acupuncture and structural massage, and I'm doing it all. I'm like all in. I'm, I'm hearing an intuition. It's like a discernment. All I knew before was how to navigate hell quickly and effectively. But I, and I thought I had an intuition. I thought I was so clever. Nope. And now it's like, oh, that's what discernment is. And it feels like safety feels like safety in my body and it's calming down. It's life-changing. Mm -hmm. So a little bit, Annie, first about, you can tell them anything you want to tell them about me. It's fine. But like, what was it like? Cause we've had several series together to real, to realize, oh, this, this sweet body is on nonstop hyper alert, hyper vigilance. Yeah. So you, it's like, you know, if you think about the, the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight system is kind of like a toggle switch. And a lot of people come in with their toggle switch binged up on the ceiling, which yours was, you know, super hypergenic, kind of jumpy, can't calm down, can't rest. Um, and over the time that we worked with one another, doing both cranial therapy and um, PSIP work, your toggle switch toggled down, still toggling down yeah. to a place of well-being. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that that's the <laughs> big difference after doing this work. Before this work, there's always something wrong. You're wrong. Or I'm wrong. The situation's wrong. And after doing this work and the sympathetic nervous system calms down, there's nothing wrong. Yeah. It's a big difference. I had no idea the degree to which I hated myself. All of this was my fault. What's wrong with me? Why am I attracting and creating this over and over? I'm clever. I have such good intentions. I do the work, but I just couldn't get out of that pattern with, with abuse of men personally or professionally. And it, and I was so self hate self hating of myself and, and to forgive myself, to have understanding and compassion and to understand, Oh, that's why. It just, everything got quiet. I mean, some of my sessions with you that the still point or the cranial sacral mixed with the medicine, I never knew there was a piece like this. I mean, I knew disassociated piece, the respite out there, but I never knew the embodiment of it. And I want everyone to have this. <laughs> I think when you've had early childhood trauma, at least in my experience, I had never experienced well-being. I'd, I'd never, I didn't know what that felt like to feel safe. Yeah. Yeah. You, you use smoke, Annie, to, <laughs> in, in, in sessions, Annie's body, her, your experience of the body would, would become like, oh, I feel like smoke, you could see right through me, uh, you know, different versions of what dissociation looks and feels like. Yeah. 
for wow. some people it's like and, and then later as we got deeper into the work stage, it was like I'm underneath the Arctic shelf there's this big ice block on top of me I can see you out there but I can't feel you damn it's cold in here you know um so wow. disassociation can express itself in a lot of different ways yeah I think that the trickiest manifestation of it is that it really can look just like calm right so behaviorally speaking you know somebody who's in a very calm associated what we call a state zero place they can look exactly like somebody who's deeply deeply gone right deeply dissociative um and you know if you ask a person who's in that highly dissociative state how are you doing they'll say oh I'm, I'm doing fine i feel fine right but then if you probe a little bit more if you inquire well what does fine really feel like there you're going to get pretty quickly this sense that th they're not referencing their direct experience they're not ref there's no body online for them to reference they're referencing an, an idea or a concept of being fine Right. So versus somebody who's an actual state of calmness, they can tell you, you know, because neutrality has a feeling to it. Right. You can sit in a chair and feel your butt in the chair. You can feel your chest. You can feel your throat. You can there's there's feeling going on all over the place, even in the state of neutrality. Totally. I remember Annie would always ask me, what kind of calm? To explain calm. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> um, a little bit, I want to honor your time, but I want people to understand the difference with the medicines. Um, my experience, this is just me, but the MDMA was very much like a, like kind of getting through all the muck. And then when I would do the cannabis, it was almost like I could hear, and I feel like it's a her, like, and very instructional. And she would explain this and help my body align and, and just show me such wisdom, putting my body back together again. That's been my experience. I haven't done uh, psilocybin with it. I haven't done ayahuasca since I began this particular journey. I haven't done ketamine. Can you explain the, the beauty of the different medicines or combination thereof um, that PSIP utilizes? Do you want to speak to this, Annie, or...? <clears throat> Let's both speak to it. How about that? That's good. Um, you know, I, I, first of all, I work with a lot of combat veterans and they came to me saying, look, I'm looking at all the clinical trials where 83% of people with PTSD no longer meet the criteria for PTSD anymore. We're going to do this medicine. Yeah. We're, we're not waiting around because we're truly trying hard not to kill ourselves. Right? Hey, are you going to help us or should we do this by ourselves? And my response is like, well, let's not do that by yourself. How, how about that? You know? And um, so what you put into your body is your own business. I'm not giving you anything. I'm not suggesting to you to you take anything, but um, what the medicine seemed to do for them was till up the emotional body till up was what wasn't serving them um and the cannabis then seemed to come behind and help discharge what wasn't serving them and help them come into their sense of wholeness and well-being or as as Saj says our birthright mm -hmm. um so the the medicines kind of learn from each other and work with each other um it, it seems and of course we're on the frontier we're still learning about this because we're all snowflakes. And my experience of a certain medicine will be totally different than yours. Um, so it's a personal decision that each individual needs to make. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'll be happy to speak to this as well. So uh, the way that I see it, um, I think to some degree, all psychedelic medicines do some things that are similar, right? And for example, they all degrade the default mode network in the brain and they all give us, and that, that means that our secondary consciousness, which normally our ordinary state of adult consciousness kind of goes away and then we get access to a much more primitive form of consciousness. So every psychedelic does that in one degree or another. Having said that, there are unique gifts that these medicines bring. Uh, and the two that we work with simply because of their ease of availability are, uh, are cannabis and ketamine. Now, 
I'm going to speak to cannabis a bit because I think that most people have an experience with cannabis and they, they don't think it's a psychedelic. And you will be shocked <laughs> that, you know, cannabis is like it's it com can completely change its nature based on the context in which it's being used. So, you know, we talk about set and setting a lot here. You will not believe how much cannabis can go from sort of a, you know, a recreational, fun, easy kind of experience that can be dissociative in nature to if you change the context in which it's being used it can become one of the most powerful excavating tools that we have in terms of uh, any psychedelic that I've ever seen. Um, it is it is the thing that I think mo works most effectively with dissociation. And so very frequently, uh, you know, let, let me tell you a quick story. So we had we were uh, doing some clinical work in Amsterdam and people would come from the US to uh, do psilocybin work there with us. And we found that there was a, a, a certain amount of people, it could be as high as 30%, that were complete non-responders to psilocybin. It didn't matter how much they took, they just didn't have a, a response. And then because they needed to wait at least a few days before their next uh, session with that, we started saying, well, you know, if you wanted to, we can do cannabis uh, assisted psychotherapy right now. And we found that that for people who like psilocybin did nothing for them, the cannabis took hold. Right. It really it, it meets people in a very different place than a more traditional uh, psychedelic would. Uh, it's highly body oriented. It, again, it clears dissociation relic pretty quickly. I mean, to I would say even so quickly that it's something to, you have to take account of, you know, because again, the, the dissociation is there for a reason. It's covering something up. And all of a sudden when it's gone, then the client has something really significant sitting in, in her lap, right? So... So that's how we use cannabis and then to ketamine much more, much more similar to, to the classic tryptamines, right? So it's a wide spectrum psychedelic experience, whereas cannabis is a, like a one trick pony. And the one trick that it does is the most amazing trick ever. <laughs> and, um, yeah. I love that. Sometimes our, in our series, Annie, the cannabis would be more intense for me than the MDMA, uh, and I remember uh, after we'd done a couple of series and it was July 4th and I'm like, oh, I'll just do a little cannabis and go to the rodeo for July 4th. Oh, that was a bad idea. I went right into <laughs> home. So I, I have great respect now and so much gratitude for the, the, the intentionality around the medicine, the PSA protocol and, the, and the, the surrender and trust of my body. Yeah, it's been amazing. Um, I want everyone to know how to contact each of you um, to take further steps, um, and then I'll ask you um, a follow-up question. But Annie can be reached at thestillpoint.info. All of this will be in the show notes as well. And Saj and the Psychedelic Somatic um, Institute is psychedelics. Uh, psychedelicsomatic.org, and you can find practitioners there. You can get training there. We got to see if we can get me a non-licensed therapist in there to get trained as well, because this has changed my whole life. In fact, I now see even in a non-medicated uh, session with people, I see the disassociation. I never saw it before because I never saw it in me. And the allowance work that I've done completely works. And it's extraordinary. Uh, this trust and listening of the body um, and helping them to tap in. It's been, it's affected all my clients. And I'm so grateful that all, like it can pass through me to the, to these viewers and to the people that I love and and get to to witness and facilitate. So, um, help two things I want you to do, viewers and listeners. Um, please subscribe to this wonderful show. Leave a review if you would. It really helps these algorithms so that more people can benefit from this extraordinary conversation. And two, I want you to take an action. Like you're a ship, and you just sort of turn the wheel one little degree. You're going to end up in another continent if you're a ship. And if it's your life, your whole life trajectory could have shifted because of this conversation today. And that's my, that's my intention for you. So please contact each of them at the, at the websites. And even more so when this conversation is done, don't just rush off to something else. Please just take a few moments, maybe go outside in nature, put your feet on the ground. What touched you? What moved you? What resonated? What maybe made you tear up? Follow that. Follow that into an action that will honor your beautiful life and beautiful relationships. So in conclusion, I could talk to you for hours. I've been looking forward to this for so long and it's so good to see you, Annie. Um, 
let's uh, with you first, Annie, how would you like to complete this interview from your beautiful heart to all the viewers and listeners? Mm. Well, I think that we are in a psychedelic revolution yeah. and it's timely because it seems like we're going off the rails in a lot of ways. And so what's happening uh, as I experience it, it uh, personally and see it around me is we're becoming more empathetic by doing this work, personally empathetic, where I am more awake to how to heal myself and care for myself so that I can be compassionate and heal and care for you. And that seems to be uh, exponentializing in, in our culture. And it's the only hopeful thing really, that I know. And it's extremely hopeful. And I'm so glad to be part of that revolution with both of you, Alana and you, Saj. It's such mm -hmm. a blessing. Mm, you're such a blessing. I so agree with the, the empathy and self-forgiveness. And it's helped me also take ownership to be more owning of what a, how I contributed to situations and dissolve the blame and make amends and, and learn and grow. So I think my, my goal these days is to not put anything between my heart and another person's heart. Mm. Constantly, all day long. How do I mm. do that? Yeah. Yeah. Hearts laid wide open. Yeah. Mm, thank you. And how about from your beautiful heart, Saj? Yeah. So let me, um, let me touch on two things here. Um, uh, something that is just about to be published, uh, and it's going to be published, uh, in just on the ninth of this month. So by the time people hear this, it'll already be out there. Um, uh, two former students, uh, of, of mine who are, uh, based where Annie is based in Utah. And they did a, um, uh, pre and post surveys uh, of um, uh, different clients doing this work. And they, they came up with a case study that, again, is about to be published. And it's a pretty remarkable case study. It was with a, a client who had um, qualified for the uh, dissociative subtype of PTSD, meaning that, you know, there was that strong numbing avoidance layer going on to their to their trauma. And so they did 10 PSIP sessions with cannabis and again, taking pre-tests and post-tests after every session. And by the end of it, um, according to the scales that, the, that were used, this person had a 98.5% reduction in, in their PTSD scores and their uh, dissociation scores, right? So pretty, pretty wonderful. And we're, we're dedicated towards gathering more data so we can show more of that. But now shifting back to what, the, <laughs> to actually uh, uh, communicating um, from my heart, uh, let me see, I will, I will say that um, this is, this work is something that references some, you know, something profound about all of us and something profound about the, the soup that we're swimming in uh, about, about being, meaning that all people have to do is look deeper inside of themselves and they're able to get in touch with this profound healing force that knows exactly what it's doing. And all we're doing in the PSIP model is setting up a container to help that happen a little bit more to sort of help the, the distractions and the, the, the not so great coping mechanisms fall away. And then we get to really see what the darkness holds for us, right? We get to really see what you know, those places that we've been organized to never touch, to never see inside of ourselves, when we actually go there, it, those places begin to reform and reorganize. And, and I will tell you that we, we don't push anything around. We don't, we don't, you know, what we, we're holding the container and then the process knows exactly where it's going. Right. So, um, you know, to me, this is spirituality <laughs> and like, and I, I find it through the body, right? So instead of sort of doing a transcendent move, my, you know, I think this work is saying like, no, no, let's go deeper, deeper, deeper into the earth. And then there's spirit waiting for us there as well. Mm -hmm. I love you both so much. Yes. Um, there's a, one last thing I want to share with all of you that I've been devouring all the the, the white paper, please go to the site and download that. There's so many incredible videos. You'll learn so much. Um, but I wrote this down. 
your ability to feel and engage uh, these symptoms is integral to healing them. And so all of you that have been following me for the last decade or so, I'm so grateful because we talk about feeling. We talk about feelings aren't bad. We talk about hearts splayed wide open. We talk about breath. We talk about that little you inside your heart that's feeling that way and going towards them and holding them, but with no need to fix them, a willingness to sit with them for eternity, just as they are, total allowance. And then the magic shifts and the bravery evolves and arises out of us. And it's this beautiful bravery that allows us to do this incredible work. I thank you both for the bravery of all that you've done with getting this into the world. I thank you, Annie, so much for having my back and being my angel. It is an honor, Saj, to finally meet you that she speaks of. Saj Baba, Saj Baba. <laughs> um, and I encourage you all to take that brave, self-loving act and dive in and open up and come home. It's our birthright, as they've said. So until next time on Intimate Conversations, Season 11, Soul Medicine, we are so freaking glad you were with us today. All of my love. See you next week on Intimate Conversations. Get out there and make love to life. So I just finished my acupuncture appointment. This is my friend. <laughs> He's always waiting for me outside. It's so lovely. And she has like, I don't know how many acres, maybe 20 acres, tons of cows and horses and there's cats and dogs and there's a pig when it's warmer that comes out to say hello and uh as I drove in there was a horse just sitting right in the middle of the road and so I just gave it it's gave it its time so what an amazing interview huh I think my favorite part was at the end when when Saj was saying you know we don't have to leave and go out into the stars to feel this incredible connection and home you know we get to go in we get to dive in to this place of well-being and wholeness and stillness inside um, and I'm so grateful for this uh, modality this protocol that's been so supportive to my well-being oh my god and then all the other things I do like my acupuncture here or my cranial sacral or my structural massage my chiropractor just you know honoring my body that I've just pushed so hard ignoring for so long running so fast so I'd like you to follow up uh, Saj you know the director of education psychedelic somatic.org Annie Annie King the still uh, there's lots of practitioners that you can find if this modality speaks to you and then to really have it complemented I find that on its own the uh, the changes are profound but then you've got to integrate them into your life you've got to have those conversations You've got to navigate family and work and money and health and so many things. And so the coaching that we do in my organization is just the perfect complement to this PSI journey. And so if you want to learn more, we'd love to support you. It's a privilege and an honor to do so. Ah, oh, so I'll just give you a little bit of a look how blue the sky is here. Isn't it wild? And how white the snow is and so very cold. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next time on Intimate Conversations Soul Medicine. This is here to nurture your soul embodied on this beautiful planet that we get to share together. I sure love you. Mm.